We're only a few days away from Halloween, and with the season comes a renewed interest in all things scary and occult. Movies, books, television shows, and yes, even anime and manga take center stage, all with one goal in mind. Scare the ever-loving daylights out of you. For me personally, Halloween is my favorite time of year, and no matter how much big box stores like Target and Walmart want to pretend like Halloween is over by the time the second week of October has passed, the fervent love of those that celebrate this magical time of year bursts forward as you walk or drive down any suburban street. Christmas may come hard and fast, and much too soon for my liking. But as long as I can celebrate the crisp cold air, the falling leaves, and the decorations strewn across my front yard while Halloween specials play in the background, I will. Shoujo manga and horror have had a peanut butter and jelly type relationship since the late 60s, with dedicated magazines, OVAs, and adaptations since the mid 80s, but oftentimes you rarely hear anything about them and most of the aforementioned magazines have since ceased publication, with a lot of the manga within fading into relative obscurity, besides a few notable releases. TikTok, Google, and YouTube are likewise sparse, with only one real dedicated research paper written 13 years ago, a few scattered articles here and there, and a handful of videos, both long and short form. Considering how much of a pillar of the community horror was and still is to this day, and how much influence it still has, it's a bit surprising how underrepresented it is. And as hard as it might be to believe, Halloween as a holiday has only really been around in Japan for 20-odd years, long after any of these magazines had ended, beginning life as an illegal underground gaijin movement, and only gaining traction once Disney had some say. I'm... Getting a little ahead of myself, though. All will be revealed in good time. With that said, though, let's take a look at the history of shoujo horror, the influences it had, and how Halloween has become the holiday it is today in Japan. If you're familiar at all with Japanese folklore, then the idea of horror being as popular as it was and still is shouldn't be a surprise. Stories of yokai, myths, and spirits permeated the culture throughout history, even down to Japan adopting the Chinese Hungry Ghost Festival, or Bon Matsuri, a holiday to honor those who have passed. A Buddhist tradition started by a disciple of Buddha who, upon realizing his deceased mother was suffering in the realm of the Hungry Ghosts, gave offerings to the monks in order to release her spirit and send her back to her permanent dwelling. Upon doing so, and taking stock in the great love and selflessness his mother showed, he began to dance with joy. Nowadays, the holiday is celebrated in August like a large, spooky, ancestral family reunion. With a big party, sometimes even a carnival, the performance of the Ban Ori, the aforementioned dance, and finishing with the Okirubi, or sending fire, so that the spirits that have returned can go home once again. Celebrations like these and others are just one of many examples of the spiritualism and supernaturalism within Japanese culture, and that extends to their fiction as well. Interestingly enough, women have almost always seemingly been at the center of those stories, though not always in a way you'd expect or enjoy. You see, most ghost stories in Japan, stories of evil, vengeful spirits are told with women as the main antagonist. The reason is that culturally, when women are wrong, they go through a sort of psychological metamorphosis. Beauty becomes ugly, culture becomes wild, and quiet becomes loud and accusatory. These women, these unpredictable spirits, are there to tear men down and send a warning that a woman scorned is a woman to fear. Despite their antagonistic framing, though, they are often viewed as strong, sometimes all-powerful, and in control of their own agency, something that comes into play when shoujo manga enters the picture. 
it's here where we jump into the 1960s, and if you've watched some of my other videos, you'll know that this is where shoujo manga began to diversify and grow, as maho shoujo, romantic comedies, and yes, even horror began to show up in these magazines. One of the first to do so was drifting classroom mangaka Kazuo Omezu, a proponent of the Gekiga movement of the mid to late 50s, specializing in stories of the paranormal, Umezu began writing in Kodansha's shoujo friend, with one of the first stories to gain traction being I'm Scared of Mama. On the surface, it seems like your typical horror setup. Mother becomes sick, daughter goes to visit, monster begins to terrorize her. The kicker is that the snake-like creature has her mother's face, and is doing everything in its power to devour the girl. The reason this was so revolutionary at that time was that up until this point, most shoujo manga was bright, happy, and cheery, and celebrated the relationship between mother and daughter, and how good and pure that was. So, for manga readers, especially shoujo fans, this was something unheard of and something that fans began to eat up fervently. As much as they were scared and appalled, there was a little part of them that was fascinated by all of this. Umezu himself even brought it up when he was interviewed later on. At that time, shoujo manga always depicted the attachments of mothers and children, of which I harbored suspicion. Daughters are grateful for their mothers, but also sometimes bothered by them. Mothers often think of their daughters as their own possessions, which is a scary thought. Umezu would go on to revolutionize shoujo horror throughout the 60s, with classics such as Butterfly Grave, Baby Girl, Reptilia, and Red Spider all being released in Shoujo Friends. I know classic manga, especially classic shoujo, is a hard sell for many, but if you can find a way to read these aforementioned series, please do, as they are all master classes in how to write and draw horror manga. During that period, he would also begin writing for Shonen Sunday, with Orochi, Cat-Eyed Boy, and heading into the 70s with The Drifting Classroom probably being his most well-known works, and still being published in the West to this day. Even taking his works to a shonen publication, his roots were still firmly in shoujo. His unique style of taking traditionally beautiful and serene shoujo artwork and twisting it into something horrific would become a massive inspiration for many future artists and help dub him the god of horror manga among many of his fans and peers. Parsing through any manga subreddit or forum, you'll often see at least one of his works in most people's collections. Even those that claim they hate and refuse to read shoujo probably have at least one of his books. His works would then help kickstart the trend of shoujo horror, but he most certainly wouldn't be the last. With the taboo door firmly kicked into oblivion, we would start to receive more and more shoujo horror as time went on, with another notable name being Yamagishi Ryoku, a member of the now infamous Year 24 group. Though a lot of her stories veered away from the traditional horror structure found in Umezu's work, it opened up a door to a different sort of horror, one unique to the shoujo readership. Expectations. While there were still gothic motifs and plenty of scary and ugly visuals, Yamagishi helped usher in the idea of a volatile mother-daughter relationship. Her dedication to deconstructing this genre of loving your mother, being subservient, accepting a future in motherhood and submissiveness, and showing that as a type of conflict and horror instead of something to be cherished was something wholly unique and something completely feminine. The idea of gender and sex at the time weren't something being explored, at least not in Japan and not in that light. Supernatural images are great and all, but the expectations of girlhood and the idea that these can be explored through a complex, sometimes negative, and even fearful lens really helps shape the appeal of what makes shoujo horror unique. Aesthetics are great and all, but providing an emotional outlet for girls to feel afraid of potential inevitability was something really special. Yamagishi wasn't the only one either. 
while she spent the late 60s through the mid-90s exploring the complexities of relationships, other mangaka in the 70s began tackling a different kind of feminine horror. Bullying. Despite high school being a widely popular set piece for shoujo manga, oftentimes it was shown as a place of love and friendship, not horror. One of the first to flip this on its head and tackle this kind of topic was Glass Mask author Michue Suzue, who released The White Silhouette in the early 70s. Not only did it deal with bullying, but it dealt with ghosts, spiritualism, and the rise of Kokuri, which is essentially a handmade Ouija board for students to try and solve mysteries or communicate with spirits. It's here and in subsequent works that we would also see the trope of the Reikon girl come to fruition, those that would empathize and show compassion towards these spirits and become a sort of projector for their thoughts and feelings. Combining the idea of a mystery to be solved and resolving it with compassion and kindness while spotlighting the very real fear of bullying and isolation became an important tool in shoujo horror of the 70s. You had the body horror creature feature of Umezu, the motherly dread of Yamagishi, and now the catharsis of solving a mystery of fear and isolation, something that realistically any high school girl has felt at some point, and you had a recipe for some truly great works. Because not only were they scary, but they felt real and relatable in a way that this male-dominated world can sometimes feel like. As the years would go on, topics like gender expression, dark romanticism, and escapism would rise up, but with all of these stories releasing and horror films both domestic and international gaining traction, it only seemed fair that someone try and capitalize on this growing trend, especially as women became an increasingly larger and larger consumer of the medium, and where there's profit, there's opportunity. Enter Monthly Halloween the first ever shoujo magazine dedicated exclusively to horror. The magazine was published by Asahi Sanrama, an offshoot of the Asahi Shimbam, one of the largest newspapers in Japan and the second largest print newspaper in the world behind only the Yamariri Shimbam, though if you include digital, it's much farther down the list. The idea and justification behind creating Monthly Halloween was that shonen manga magazines were starting to become a bit oversaturated. And trying to start a new one was like trying to start a YouTube channel in 2023, or in some cases return after a near six-month hiatus. While there were plenty of shoujo magazines, compared to shonen, it was a much easier market to jump into, especially if you had a niche. So the rise in horror media and diversification in shoujo manga, including shoujo horror, monthly Halloween seemed like an easy slam dunk. Publish some articles and photos of upcoming movies and television shows, recommend some curated horror media for people to check out, toss in some manga spearheaded and endorsed by Kazuo Mezu himself, and you have a recipe for success. So on Friday the 13th of December 1985, the first issue was released with the message, For those who are tired of happiness. Since Umezu was still incredibly busy with his own work and didn't have time to write an ongoing for the magazine, he began the Kazuo Umezu Prize, a contest to find new talent to work on monthly Halloween. The first winner of said prize was a young up-and-comer named Junji Ito with his manga Tomie. If you remember my comment about most manga collectors having at least one Umezu book in their collection, you can almost guarantee that every manga collector has at least one, if not many, Junji Ito books in their collection. Even people who are casual readers or don't usually buy manga have read Junji Ito. The man is synonymous with horror in a way only Clive Barker, Guillermo del Toro, or Stephen King is. If Umezu is the god of horror, then Ito is his Christ, both in terms of popularity and positioning. I could spend literal hours talking about his works, but so has everyone else, and that's not the point of this video. You can just add Tomie to the list of books that even people who say they hate Shoujo have and enjoy. 
Soon, other authors like Ochizuka Nori and Kanako Inuki would join the fray with their own publications as well. Monthly Halloween would also commission manga adaptations of popular Western horror films like Nightmare on Elm Street, Return of the Living Dead, Day of the Dead, Reanimator, Sweet Home, aka the inspiration for Resident Evil, and many more. These manga would sometimes take liberties with the source material, but with Western horror becoming a huge inspiration for Japanese horror media, and with it growing in consumption every passing year, it all made sense. If nothing else, just remember that Freddy Krueger is technically a shoujo antagonist. So there's your fun little bit of trivia for the day. Monthly Halloween was a huge success with campy covers, in-depth articles, and a decidedly macabre tone that pushed against the norm. But like a lot of shoujo magazines that debuted in the 80s, Monthly Halloween ceased publication in 1995 after 195 issues. A large chunk of it was because of economics and shoujo horror as a genre waning in mainstream popularity after 30 years, but sometimes real-life tragedy can also have rippling effects as well. If you saw my video on the Ishike genre, you'll remember that in 1995, the sarin attacks on the Tokyo subway by religious cult Am Shariku took place, bringing an increased scrutiny to spiritualization and people who followed the supernatural. On top of that, you had the murders perpetrated by the otaku killer, Sutomo Miyazaki, which brought a lot of negative attention to any and all horror media being released at the time. This one-two punch essentially handicapped Monthly Halloween, among many other struggling publications at the time, and when you've got people breathing down your neck on top of monetary problems, not even Michael Myers can come back from that one. Much like parents in the West blamed Columbine on rock music and violent video games, so too did the moral panic arise in Japan, this time against otaku and consumers of horror media, believing that reading manga, watching anime, and horror films led to him becoming a murderer. His disconnect with reality and love of fantasy was psychoanalyzed to Kingdom Come, and through that, a focus on a more peaceful and calming media took rise, which led to the Ishike genre and the booming popularity of Slice of Life series. That said, shoujo horror didn't die with monthly Halloween. Magazines like Suspiria still existed, publishing series like Vampire Princess Miyu, Dolly of the Vampire and Presence, among many, many others. Feel Young released Haunted House by Mitsukazu Mihara, who's published many fantastic short-form shoujo and jose horror series over the year. Natsume's Book of Friends and Ghost Hunt both released to commercial and critical success, though with varying degrees of horror attached to them, and as much flack as it got, Vampire Night was one of the biggest, most popular manga releases of the 2000s, and that series was dripping with horror inspiration. Even to this day, we're still getting plenty of horror series coming out, like Moto Ikitai, Shinigami Doll, Romantic Dark, and Aka no Haiku, to name a few. There's plenty of recommendation threads and shorts out there with even more suggestions, some of which I'll link down below, but despite not getting the fanfare of their shonen counterparts or even their high school romance equivalents, shoujo horror is still out there and is still releasing for anyone that wants to read it. What about Halloween itself? Didn't I say something earlier about Disney and underground gaijin movement? Well, you'd be correct. You see, in Japan, they had Bon Matsuri, their equivalent of the spookiest time of year, and to them, Oban would always be their holiday. And despite a working knowledge of Halloween, thanks to Western media and magazines like Monthly Halloween in the 80s, it wasn't really seen as worth it to incorporate the holiday into everyday life. That was a gaijin thing not a Japanese thing. But expats were plenty in the 90s, and they wanted a chance to dress up and party. 
But where do you go when everyone who wanted to could have access to a fun, safe party? The subway. So, on Halloween, when the trains were less full, people would get on the subway, dressed up in costume, and drink and party while moving through the train for a full hour. It was disorganized, it lacked consistency, it was punk rock, and it even drew protesters telling the gaijin to leave the country and that no Japanese people wanted Halloween, but it was the most fun they could have and nobody got hurt, so there were really no losers in this situation. That was the Yamanote Halloween train. You'd think an inspirational story like that, combined with 30 years of media, would have led to something, but much like most bureaucracy in Japan, the truth is much less interesting than fiction. Tokyo Disneyland held a soft launch in 1997 for Halloween festivities before officially announcing yearly Halloween events in the year 2000. Universal Studios Japan joined in shortly after, and from that came Halloween as a recognized holiday in Japan, with the festivities growing in size every year, all the way up until 2020. There weren't many door-to-door trick-or-treaters, if any, depending on where you lived, and a lot of the western staples we've come to expect weren't started until much later, but it was still a lot of fun for people to dress up and have a party. Bon Matsuri would still exist. Other traditions would still exist. What's the harm in buying a pumpkin, an orange shirt, or a costume to have a little fun after the heat starts to taper off? At least this way, with two billion dollar corporations handling most of the heavy lifting, it beats drinking on a train. Still, however you celebrate Halloween in Japan, shoujo manga, specifically shoujo horror, is so intrinsically linked to the holiday and the culture as a whole that you really can't have one without the other. Underappreciated, underutilized, sometimes taboo, and creating a world of fantasy even for one night under the guise of a greater goal. Shoujo horror takes its centuries-long history with the supernatural, with festivals like Ban Matsuri, with stories like The Scorned Woman, and creates an outlet for women to write and consume media that isn't afraid to tackle the dark and negative feelings associated with girlhood. The fear inevitability, the hatred towards their mothers, the desire for freedom and agency, the fear of bullying and isolation, the idea of subverting what is culturally acceptable. All of these topics were deeply taboo in Japanese culture for a long time, but narrated the reality of adolescence in a way only horror can, by taking it head on and forcing you to experience the uncanny up close. Women at the time, and sadly still to this day, are viewed as the weaker members of society, but through shoujo horror are given an outlet to do and feel what they seemingly can't do in the real world. Giving women that power makes shoujo horror the beautiful yin to the yang of shoujo romance. You need the scary with the cute. You need the balance so all can feel properly represented. If you only ever show one side, then you're not properly maintaining the stability necessary for creating a balanced demographic. Standing up to cultural norms is at the heart of what makes Halloween in Japan unique, and there's no better example of that than shoujo horror. So, the next time you're in a mood for a scare, do yourself a favor and grab yourself a Kazuo Mezu manga, curl up by the fire, and experience the strange in the best way possible. Life's better when there's frights involved. Happy Halloween. Hey everybody, long time no see. I will make a very long story very short by saying I got sick, lost my voice, and couldn't really do a whole lot besides work and stay in bed, but now I'm feeling better and I've thankfully recorded in batches, so this is the first of five videos that I have recorded and edited and put together, so you'll have content going through the end of the year with maybe even a few surprises thrown in, so if you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment down below, and until then, keep on reading.